Today we're going to explore the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So we've already seen the causes of the attack. Um, we've seen the attack actually happen. <clears throat> now we're going to look at what some of the results of the attack were. So our goals are to explain the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, to compare Japanese to American losses after the war, to explain the failures of the attack on Pearl Harbor, and to explain the long-term impact of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So uh, if we look at the aftermath of the attack, of course, America is, is angry. America is upset. They're caught off guard by the attack. And so on December 7th, 1941, well, actually the day after, uh, we see President Franklin Delano Roosevelt give the official declaration of war. Senators and representatives, I have the distinguished honor of presenting the President of the United States. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. So there you have it, uh, FDR's famous December 7, 1941 speech. This was the official declaration of war on Japan and uh, eventually declaration of war on Germany. So this will officially enter America into World War II. Uh, some of the results of Pearl Harbor, uh, America lost 19 ships. There were 188 aircraft destroyed. Over 2,000 Americans died. Over another 1,000 Americans were injured. Uh, Japan, their losses were relatively small. Uh, they lost 55 airmen, 29 planes, and all but one of their mini subs. So uh, if we look at the Japanese losses, um, almost nothing. I mean, that's, that's a pretty low number for an attack. And part of this was because America was not ready for the attack. America was not ready for the battle. Where America got lucky is that when Japan was attacking Pearl Harbor, they were expecting more resistance. And so they, they didn't hit all the targets that they probably could have or should have. And so while taking out all those ships was certainly significant, uh, one of the things that they missed was the oil storage containers, the oil storage fields. Had they hit this, uh, basically the Pacific Fleet would have been crippled and America wouldn't have been able to do anything. <clears throat> Without oil to power the ships, obviously you, you have no military force. But Japan kind of missed these, uh, whether that was intentional or on purpose or rushed. Um, they, they probably should have hit the oil storage tanks and that would have made a huge difference. Another thing that they missed was our submarine base. So all our submarines were still intact. And they also missed the Navy Yard. So they weren't able to take out the Navy Yard used to repair the ships. 
And so a number of the ships that were hit during Pearl Harbor, a number of the, the ships that were attacked, uh, they would actually go on to be used later on in the war, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. So this is a look, uh, an overhead look on the day of the attack. These are the ships burning, ships on battleship row burning away. Uh, we turn to Fort Island, and I was fortunate enough to be able to visit Pearl Harbor a few years ago, and so I, I want to show you a few interesting things. Fort Island is the main base uh, where the planes landed, and if we look at this area right here, uh, that actually still exists today. Uh, and in fact, uh, as I'm showing you a picture, you're looking in like, what are those little holes in the ground? Big deal. Who cares? It's a piece of concrete. Uh, that is actually where the plane, a uh, Japanese plane, was shot down, landed, and attacked, and crashed on that area. And so those are skid marks from the landing plane as it was crashing into the ground, uh, which you see in the circled box. Uh, another view down Battleship Row. Uh, we can see, again, some of the carnage that's happening, some of the chaos. We see many of the battleships as they're being sunk or as they're going down. You can see that there is just utter and absolute destruction and damage. Uh, several ships were completely sunk. Some were heavily damaged, some were moderately damaged, and some of them actually remained untouched. So as we take a look at Pearl Harbor, as we take a look at some of the damage, we look at Battleship Row, and one of the most famous ships is the USS Arizona. Uh, that ship becomes famous because it becomes the monument, the memorial for the war. Uh, and for the attack on Pearl Harbor. And so they decided instead of raising the ship because it was already sunk, um, they decided to build a viewing platform afterwards to serve as a memorial for the war. And so the building you see in front of you, you actually go in that and you can still look at the ship in place today. Uh, if you go in, it's kind of eerily creepy because you can still see the USS Arizona uh, sunk in parts of the, the ship coming out. Um, maybe one of the things that's even creepier is even almost 100 years later, we can still see oil seeping up from the USS Arizona. And so she is buried at sea. Uh, so here are a few of my pictures from the memorial. If you ever get a chance to go to Hawaii, I highly recommend that you attend the Arizona Memorial. Um, it is just particularly um, moving. Uh, one of the other things that you see at the USS Arizona is some of the people who survived have the option of being buried uh, at sea. Uh, when they do eventually pass with their, their shipmates. And so these are people who survived the attack but eventually decided to want to be buried at sea. Uh, some of the other things that we see with the attack on the Arizona, the USS Nevada, um, valiantly tried to make its way out. Uh, it was crippled but not totally destroyed. It made it almost out of the harbor, and then she realized that she was going to get destroyed if she kept going, and that would completely block off the harbor if it was attacked again, it sunk right there, it's going to cause a major disaster, it's going to block the harbor, which would lock all the other ships in, and so she eventually moves to an area that becomes known as Hospital Point, and Hospital Point is where they will rescue everybody from the ship, and they'll also start bringing other people from other ships who were injured to this point, uh, and particularly most famous is an area known as Charlie Point. One of the cool things about the USS Nevada is that it would eventually be restored, and it would go on to fight on the D-Day battles on Utah Beach uh, on June 6, 1944. So we'll talk more about D-Day later. Uh, again, Charlie Landing at Hospital Point is where a lot of the injured sailors were brought and they were fixed up at that point. The unique memorials that you can see is the USS Utah Memorial. Uh, the USS Utah Memorial is not open to the public. One of the reasons why it's not open to the public is you have to go through the Navy base in order to get there. So really only Navy personnel can get there uh, or if you're a visitor, uh, with somebody. And so the USS Utah, they tried to uh, raise her, they tried to bring her back to life. Unfortunately, they were unable to, uh, and so then eventually they decided to make that into another memorial for what happened at Pearl Harbor. And so here are some pictures of the USS Utah Memorial. Uh, you can see she's still rusting away and she's still in the harbor. Eventually, one day, obviously, she will completely rust away and be gone, but for now, she will serve as a memorial to those who lost their lives. So we see the sunken ship, the USS Utah. Another place that was attacked was Hickman Air Force Base. So if we look at the Air Force Base, uh, this is really the entrance to the harbor. And uh, this is the, the main headquarters, the Pacific, the headquarters of the Pacific Fleet. And let's take a look at this building. When you walk in the doors, the first thing you see is this staircase, and there is still a bullet hole in the staircase today. 
If you look at the facade of the building, you will notice that there are still bullet holes there today. And this was done deliberately uh, after the attacks on Pearl Harbor. Our Air Force and our Navy said that we, we never want to get caught again. We, we never want to be caught unprepared. Because honestly, we were really unprepared for the Pearl Harbor attack. And so to make sure that we never get caught off guard, they decided to leave much of the damage that was done to Hickman Air Force Base still intact to serve as a constant reminder of what happens when you put down your guard. So uh, what I want you to do right now is evaluate, was Pearl Harbor a success for Japan? Yes or no, and more important, explain why or why not. If we look at this question, it, it's, it's sort of a tricky one, because from December 7th to June 3rd, uh, yes, it, it was. Uh, Japan was able to seriously hinder and cripple the United States military. However, they weren't able to completely knock out our military forces, and that almost made it a failure because it awoke the sleeping giant. America was now angered. They're now angry. They're now bitter. They now have an enemy to attack. Uh, honestly, America probably was never going to attack Japan in the first place if Japan wouldn't have attacked first. But they awoke the sleeping giant. They got America to fight back. And so from the Battle of Midway on June 4th up until, uh, obviously, what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Pearl Harbor is much less of a success for Japan because it gets America in the war. And so, of course, long term in the war, uh, Pearl Harbor is not a success for Japan. Japan made a number of poor decisions, uh, the first one being to attack Pearl Harbor in the first place, but even that, if they would have been successful in knocking out the oil towers, maybe they would have been had a little bit more success. But the other problem is they don't really have a plan after Pearl Harbor. They knew they wanted to damage the U.S. military. They knew they wanted to put a hit on many of the airplanes and many of the ships. They knew they wanted to disable the U.S. military, but they didn't really have a plan for what to do next. Their assumption was that America was going to give up and give in and quit fighting. Their assumption was based on the best case scenario, that America would just go into a policy of appeasement, just like France and Great Britain had done at the beginning of the war. Um, they, they really didn't have a lot of respect for the Americans or the American military. And maybe rightfully so, the American military at the start of World War II, uh, around the time Pearl Harbor attacked, was still relatively weak. We were not the superpower that we were uh, at the end of World War I, and so really what Japan is banking on is America giving up and giving in, and uh, of course we don't do that. And so when we do decide to fight back, when we don't give in, uh, we, we really, Japan doesn't know what to do. They don't really have a long-term game plan for fighting the battle because they are planning on appeasement. Uh, today, I think it's interesting when you talk to people from Japan about World War II. People from Japan don't like to talk about World War II. They don't study World War II. They don't talk about any of the military accomplishments. The only thing that they focus on is the idea of peace. And so, well, we celebrate our war heroes here in America. Uh, pretty much, Japan wants to forget that they ever had a military. Japan wants to forget everything that had happened. Uh, the only thing that they really focus on in Japanese schools is talking about peace and how we can have peace. So, my question for you, if America was to go to war today, would you be willing to quit your job or drop out of school and risk your life for your country? Uh, and, of course, explain why or why not. Most men, once the attack on Pearl Harbor happened, uh, very bravely and valiantly heeded the call and they joined the U.S. military. And so before World War II started, America uh, had only about 34,000 people in the military combined. Uh, this was 19th in the world at the time, behind Belgium and Portugal. Our military forces are maybe a little bit more powerful than that. Sometimes we can call them top 10 because of the amount of ships that we had. But the number of people that we had uh, was incredibly small. I mean, if we look at what other countries looked like, uh, both in the Axis and the Allies, um, pretty much most countries in the world had a bigger military than us. And so by the time we hit World War II, we're not in really good shape. When Japan sort of underestimated the American might, um, you know, it, it was for good reason. We didn't have a very big military. However, immediately following the attack on Pearl Harbor, over 5 million men voluntarily joined the military. Uh, they didn't even have to be drafted in. Uh, we will draft another 10 million people through the Selective Service Act. And so by that point in time, we've got over 15 million people in our military, which will make us a forbid...
which will make us a formidable force to be reckoned with. Uh, now, if we're going to put together one of the most powerful militaries in the world, you might wonder how long exactly does that take? Well, not as long as you might think. Uh, training in the military took about eight weeks. So when you think uh, about the time to, to go from being a civilian to being a world-class top fighter in the military, uh, eight weeks of basic training, and then you were sent off to fight. Anybody know who this soldier is? Uh, it's a pretty famous soldier. All right, all right. So uh, his name is Private Johnny. Uh, that is Private John Gonsier. Uh, that is my grandfather. That's uh, him training for World War II. He would eventually go on to serve in the, the Pacific Front and the island of New Guinea, which we won't talk a lot about in this class. But uh, certainly he played a role in World War II, and, and I'm very proud of the accomplishments of my grandfather, Private Johnny. Well, that's all I've got for today. I hope you have a great day.